Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Um, and Sarah, should we maybe introduce ourselves? Yeah. yeah. Given there's only 11 of us and we have interstate guests, how about we just quickly go around the room and just say where, where, who you are and where you work and just... Do you, do you want to start Heather and then Carolyn? Hi, I'm Heather. I'm from um, Clinic 281, which is a sexual health, sexual and reproductive health hub in Bairnsdale in East Gippsland. And we're relatively new, but probably I should stop saying that now. It was started, we started last year. Okay, thanks. Great. Thanks, Heather. Carolyn? Hi, folks. I'm Carolyn. I'm the manager of the 1800 My Option service at Women's Health Victoria, and we're Victoria's phone line for contraception, abortion, and sexual health. Sarab, and then Lara. Um, hi, everyone. This is Saurav. I'm one of the sexual health and wellbeing officers at SEARCH, which is Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health. Thank you. Hey, I'm Lara. I'm a GP obstetrician and a sneaky little M top and uh, S top provider over in Echuca in Northern Victoria. Great, sneaky little providers. <laughs> Sorry, Erin and then Lou. Hi, I'm Erin Kelly, GP obstetrician up in Mildura um, and the Mallee and provide termination services in. Robinvale, Muldura, uh, with multiple different clinics, both public and private. Lovely to see you, Erin. Thank you. Lovely to see you all too. Hi, everybody. It's Louise Holland here. I'm nurse practitioner at the Sexual and Reproductive Health Hub in Bendigo. Um, so we provide the majority of um, bulk build MTOP services. Um, and I also work at the Bendigo Hospital as a nurse practitioner um, in preparation for women for the um, surgical termination with the um, staff specialist, Dr. Sarah Vanderwell. Thanks, Lou. How about Robin and then Angie go next for intro? Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. I'm Robin. I'm, I'm a sexual and reproductive health nurse at Peninsula Health, and I work alongside um, Angie, who's here today, and Kathy and Dr. Nikki as well. Welcome, Robin. <clears throat> Angie Reid. Hello, I'm Angie Reid. I am a GP doing lots of IUD insertions and similar things. Whereabouts are you, Angie? Coburg, glorious Coburg. Coburg, oh, great. Um, I can see, oh, Kath McNamee and then Kathy Helmarek. Uh, Kathy McNamee from Sexual Health Victoria. We used to be Family Planning Victoria. Thanks, Kathy. Kathy, we can see you. We can't see you, but we know you're there. She might have just dropped out for a minute. So that's Kathy Helmarek, who's a nurse practitioner at, Co at um, Peninsula Health. And there's Raylin. Are you able to say where you are? Hi, I'm sorry, I'm at the train station, but my name's Raylin, and I'm an honor student in the Department of General Practice at the University of Melbourne. And Melbourne, did you say? University of Melbourne. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Welcome aboard. And we have iPhone 13, <laughs> mystery guest. Who's that? Can you, are you able to introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. You introduce yourself, particularly in a forum like this, so that we just know who's who we're um, broadcasting to. So there's one that says iPhone 13, and then there's another with the a telephone number only. So it'd be nice if you introduced yourself. Thanks. <clears throat> um, 
So we've got two people on the phone call. So are you just able to introduce yourself and say where you work? Sorry, yeah, I think I've unmuted. Is that yep. working? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, um, this is this is Dr. Sophie uh, Lindstedt. I'm working at Clinic Two Eight One in Bensal. Oh, oh right. Oh, nice to Sophie. hear your voice, Sophie. So Sophie. Was yeah. Sorry. sorry, I finished work very late, so I'm actually in the car. That's why I had to call in. But that's okay. That's all right. We just yep. uh, like to know who's on the line. That's all. So thanks. Great, yep. you can join us. And I haven't Sophie. started driving yet. Oh, okay. Can you can you hear me as well? It's Angie from yeah. The Carolyn's nodding. Yes. Yeah. yeah great. I'm in the Angie. Car. You I'm must be car. iPhone 13. I think you saw me flash with car lights. I'm in the car as well, so that's okay. why I didn't answer. Great. So Fantastic. I'll just un, I'll just unmute. So I think on the other iPhone that, that oh there I yeah. am. I'm in the other iPhone 13. So I'm just yeah, listening. Okay, great. Welcome, Angie. Welcome Thank to you. all. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Carolyn now to give us an update about sort of what's uh, the service update for 1800 My Options. Thanks, Kath. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm in Warrnambool today. We're down here um, working with Women's Health Bow and Southwest and a few other organisations about services in the southwest of Victoria, which is really exciting. Uh, 1800 My Options remains pretty busy at the moment. We're at around about 120 or so calls a week. Still seeing around 90% of our callers looking for abortion services, followed by LARC, um, pregnancy options counselling, things like that. We've still got around three quarters of our callers under the nine weeks mark. So we're definitely seeing a lot of demand for medication abortion. But um, the top end of the... Um, Callers, so the people that are around 18 to 24 weeks, remains at around, you know, anywhere between four and six percent. So it's still a significant proportion of our callers. Now we are, um, as I said, we're in Warrnambool. We're really trying to um, reach out to rural services across Victoria to connect with us on, um, and particularly registration on the database that we have. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're in Warrnambool at the moment because we're trying to support services to become a little bit more accessible to people in their local area so that when we do have callers from country Victoria, which is around 18, 20 to, 18 to 22 percent of our callers, we can actually refer them somewhere locally rather than suggest that they travel um, down to Melbourne. We far prefer them to be able to access something locally. So it's great to see a lot of rural providers. Um, and in another bit of news, uh, Women's Health Victoria has just today gone live with data for medication, abortion and LARCs all across Victoria. I'm going to drop in the chat the link to the Victorian Women's Health Atlas. So you can look at, um, it goes by LGA. So what you can do is you can look at the number of MTOPs that were prescribed in a particular LGA in a calendar year, as well as the LARCs that were um, provided. And the really cool thing about this is that you can see the number of MTOPs that pregnant people received alongside the number of MTOPs that were prescribed from within that LGA. And this is where we actually start to be able to identify big areas of need in the state because we can see there are a lot of parts of Victoria where um, demand for MTOP is pretty high but provision of that in that local area is not meeting the demand. So people are having to travel significant distances. This is something we already knew, and I know that everyone in the room was really aware of that, but we've finally actually got the numbers that support that so that we can start doing some population level planning to be able to address um, need for SRH services. So it's really exciting. I'm gonna drop the link into the chat, but I'd also really encourage anyone to get in touch with me and the folks at Women's Health Victoria, if you want to talk about this data, talk through it and, um, you know, think about ways that we can actually start responding to local need locally, rather than having people travelling uh, out of their local area, then we're really happy to work with everyone. So thanks. 
just respond to that. So thank you very much, Carolyn. It's always great to get that update. And um, if I could just say that within 24 hours of you going live, we're going to use that data in a lobbying meeting that we've got up at Ballarat. So tomorrow, Kath and I are going for a two day visit to Ballarat to do some on the ground teaching and mentoring of a LARC provider who just wants to increase her scope of practice. We're going to have a bit of a chat to the hub there about getting more uh, early medical abortion providers. And then we're going to go and help the clinical leads at Ballarat Base Hospital argue the case that we all know uh, that they need a surgical service to service that whole uh, <clears throat> Grampians region and to counteract the narrative that comes from the board of directors and from the hospital exec that there's no problem that women can go just mm -hmm. down to Melbourne. So we've got we've got the, the data and I so I, I say it just about every meeting, but the data that, that 1800 is generating is an absolutely fabulous resource. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, and it's only as good as the people that put the data in and um, give you their names and everything. So it's it's growing by the by the day. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I think it's about time to turn to our case study. Oh. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we often do at these meetings is to try to get, you know, a, a case that has plucked some interest or discussion at one of the hubs or in one of the consults where uh, one of the providers has rung us for a bit of help. And um, Peninsula Health tonight are going to um, go through a recent case and I wanted to just emphasize um, right from the get go that there isn't an error. There isn't a clinical error to discover. There isn't a, a problem, but you don't always get the perfect outcome and the patient's experience isn't always perfect, which is why we're using this one to tease out uh, a few issues and to generate some discussion. Um, so, uh, Kathy Halmarek, do you want to start going yes. through the case? Uh, hi, Patty and Kath. I just wondered whether you're happy to share the screen, Kath, of the case study. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still there. Oh. It's on our other screen. <laughs> <laughs> can, can people, they should stay. Able to see it though. Yeah, look, I think. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Um, so, um, do you want me to just start talking about Lena? She's a 32 year old yeah. um, you, woman. You, you talk and I'll scroll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she identified as female and she presented to our uh, uh, Clinic 185, which is our medical abortion service at Peninsula Health. Her family and social history, she lives with a husband only, doesn't have any children and um, hasn't got any family in Australia. So she's a G1P naught and her, the gestational age was about 7.3 weeks on ultrasound. And that ultrasound was done on the 25th of March. Uh, she had no compl complex medical history, no, not on any medications and no allergies um, and hadn't had a previous pregnancy. She had had a past history of endometriosis, which uh, was diagnosed by laparoscopy at the Royal Women's in 2020. Um, so she came in, oh, oh, so first of all, like uh, many of you, we do the initial intake uh, by telephone uh, assessment. And we have, and then we send uh, people for their bloods and ultrasound if they need them. So her HCG was about 50,000 international units per litre on the 16th of the 3rd. And that was about uh, almost two weeks prior to her having the medical abortion. The in, she had a, a confirmed uterine pregnancy of 7.3 weeks on the 25th of the 3rd. And she was very clear about her decision that she didn't want to continue the pregnancy. She wanted to proceed with an, an early medical abortion. She opted for a, the medical a method rather than surgical. Uh, she consented to the MS2 step and she had 
uh, contraception was also discussed with her at that appointment and she decided to have an IUD as well. So she had the mifepristone on the 29th of March and misoprostol on the 31st of March. And she reported pain and bleeding following the miso, felt that the, the products of conception were passed or the pregnancy was passed. And that was uh, just, um, she told us about that on, uh, with a follow-up phone call on the 6th of April. Um, her pathology test was repeated, the HCG on day 14, and that was uh, 2030, greater than 80% decline from her first HCG. She had a face-to-face -face review with our doctor. And at that time she had a migraine and she said she never usually gets migraines. Uh, she only gets them premenstrually. And she had no pain, no abnormal vaginal discharge, no heavy bleeding and no clinical signs of infection. She was afebrile as well. She started bleeding and at that time, and it was assumed that she, it may be menstrual bleeding because she'd experienced that premenstrual, well, what was thought to be a premenstrual migraine. Um, and the Marina was inserted on the same day um, as that, as that post-medical um, abortion um, appointment review consultation. So now, Kath, just scroll back down just for a second because I'm just trying to work out. So that was on day 19 that she had that review appointment and she had the IUD put in on that same day. And then about two days later, she was contacted just as a courtesy by one of the sexual health nurses um, we always phone our clients who've had an IUD just to make sure that they're okay. And she reported an increased bleeding on day one of the procedure, but no pain or, or cramping. And then on day 26, so about six days later, she contacted the service and she was worried by then. She had, couldn't locate the IUD strings she said that she'd had a migraine which had been continuous since her review appointment with uh, the GP. And she had also recently developed some pelvic pain. So over, um, over the last couple of days, she developed pelvic pain and she said that the left side was worse than the right. So she was advised to come in for a consultation. She was happy to do that. And she reported feeling unwell and tired and she actually looked quite pale as well when she came in. Um, on vaginal examination, the, the IUD strings were visible, although short. Uh, there was no malodorous vaginal discharge. She had minimal bleeding, some pain um, on cervical contact when trying to retrieve the short strings. So I just wanted to um, make sure that they weren't going to be lost in the cervical canal and cause problems later. Um, and on abdo palp, she had some discomfort and particularly tenderness, which was uh, left was greater than the right side. So the plan was to arrange for an ultrasound to check the location of the IUD. So at that point, I wasn't really thinking retained products of conception. I was thinking, you know, has she got a, a perforation or a malpositioned IUD? Um, we also decided to do um, treat her empirically for a query PID and review one week or before if, if she was concerned. So the ultrasound was then done on the 16th of the 5th. And that actually reported was reported as uh, Lena having retained products of conception with vascularization. And you can see the size there, 13 by 28 by 26 millimetres. Um, the report's actually attached, which you can we'll scroll down and have a quick look at in a sec. Mm -hmm. um, oh, do you want to have a look at that now, Kat? I know. Um, keep, keep going and I'll yeah. put it up on the screen when we start talking. Um, the, one of the unfortunate things about that ultrasound was that she saw an external provider and that provider said, um, why did you have the IUD put in at that time? Mm -hmm. You had it put in far too early and 
was a little bit undermining. But he that he contacted me and said, look, um, you may need to review this patient. She's continued to bleed and she has got retained products. So he was very uh, helpful in that sense, but um, unhelpful in what he said to the patient. So looking at the ultrasound, um, do you want to scroll down, Kat? Yeah, sure. Um, it's pretty just about what I've said, heterogeneous material with within the fundal endometrium, displaying internal vascularity. And we've already talked about the size of that. And that the that they that they consider that there's retained products of conception and that the IUD was up against that retained products as well. Um, so um, if you want to go back to the questions, Kat. Uh, so we looked at some of the questions. Do you want to read those out, Kat, or do you want me to keep going? Well, um, we could go through those questions specifically, or do you feel at liberty, you or Ange, to just say what was it that was bothering you about this case? You know. Um, well, I I did. I was worried because, as the clinician, the IUD inserter, I felt, you know, what sort of error you know had I made an error and put the client at risk put the patient at risk uh, which is the number one thing you don't you know none of us want to do um, secondly that she was so distressed about it and um, when she came back in she said look you know I know you've all been very kind and everything but um, I don't feel that you know basically that her case you know hadn't had been mismanaged by um, from the point of view that the IUD was put in too early, as the sonographer had suggested to her. So, um, yeah, so that that was a bit awkward and a bit, you know, distressing. And, of course, um, you, you, with somebody that's going through a procedure like this, you don't want to add to their stress and, and or, you know, give them concerns that they didn't otherwise have. So so that was, that, that, that was probably it from my perspective. And um, what what happened with the patient after that? Um, so she was then referred to our early pregnancy um, service and seen by a doctor there. And um, she was sent to theatre or she wanted to go to theatre. There, She had the option of going to theatre the next day or leaving it for a little bit longer because she wasn't bleeding. Um, but she wanted to get the procedure, a DNC immediately and so she was booked in the following day and she had a DNC and we had contacted her actually about a week after that and she said that she still was considering having an IUD uh, replacement so she didn't have one at the time she she uh, that was discussed with her as an option and I, again I'm not quite sure whether that is a, a reasonable option mm, um, but she, yeah. it is yeah okay and um, so, yeah, so she she didn't want to have another IUD. She just wanted to leave it for a little bit longer. So uh, we and contacted her as a courtesy call yeah. and also to see, you know, just, just, did she want any interim contraception? And at the time she said she was recovering well and no, she didn't want it. She'd taken care of the situation. So. And has she had the IUD as yet? No, she hasn't. No. She hasn't returned. Mm. So the... So thank you very much, Kathy. And again, I wanted to, uh, you know, preface our discussion is that there's been no mismanagement here at any point. Um, but it's it's one of those situations of managing the patient's experience and how they how they find it and supporting them through that. So if we look at you, the questions, which I think are very appropriate, and maybe open it up for the group, then I have some comments or teaching points from. <clears throat> the series of uh, patients that we have at the, you know, in our own experience to share with you. But what do, and, and anyone please chip in, what do people think about the timing of the IUD? What is the optimal time for inserting the IUD? Do they have to wait to have a period? Would anyone like to comment? Kathy, can I, can I just ask, sorry, was she still bleeding much at the time, the IUD? Oh, she had a period. That's right, didn't she? So, it, like, it seemed like she was having a period. Is that right? It sounded like she just started bleeding again that day. Mm. And because she had a headache, there was an yeah. assumption bleeding and her usual headache yeah. that she was having a period. 
And how long after the, the um, sorry, I, I just can't quite see back, how long? Day 21 counts. Yeah, because I must say, we probably just would have gone ahead and done it too. Like, mm. you know. <laughs> I, I don't... So if I was to say to you, do you have to wait for a period? No. We... No, no, no. Yeah, so there's a bit of, there's a bit of, mythology around that. Anyone else want to play devil's advocate and say don't put it in or do you all agree that you would have gone ahead and put it in? I've actually just clicked the MIMS guidelines because I could have sworn it. Yeah, and actually the product information very explicitly says immediately after a uh, first trimester abortion is fine. Yeah. So I take that. I mean, they're not gospel, but it's it's a nice reassurance that you're not going mad. And, you know, I would have done the same thing. And I think um, the other the other thing is that Cathy was probably concerned that there'd been a perforation with the pain and the fact that the IUD strings were significantly shortened. And I know how careful um, you are, Kath, when you're inserting IUDs and also with cutting the strings at the appropriate length and you tend to leave them longer rather than shorter. So that was a real, um, a, a really genuine concern. Uh, and, you know, it certainly would be part of the differential there. Um, but when we spoke um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Patty, we just, I think we sort of discussed perhaps another case that was very similar and uh, uh, I'm, because we're fairly in, in our early days of running the service, we're, we're quite toey about doing the right things, but um, I'm terrified of letting them go after that review appointment at three weeks without something definitive. But um, I, I saw a girl this afternoon, or I saw two women actually, but one of them was you know, a young girl and when you go through the MTOP consult and, and get all that sorted and you add in the whole contraceptive uh, issue. So her level of understanding of taking appropriate contraceptive precautions was um, the, her, the, the fellow that she'd had sex with, with used withdrawal. And it just beggars belief in this day and age with you know, we're supposed to have sex education in schools and everything else that people still think that that's okay. Um, but she was very resistant to um, looking at organising the IUD for the three-week follow-up appointment because it was just too much information. It was just, she was quite overloaded. Um, but I'm still pretty keen to put them in then. Oh, so that's um, what you meant by you were terrified of letting them go. Yeah. All right, okay, just to clarify that, because initially I thought, you meant you were terrified that something would happen at the three no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, your 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 concern for getting adequate yeah. contraception. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Particularly the, the level of knowledge or lack yeah. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to um, make any comments? Um, I, I, I just wanted to say that, like, I'm I can't do IUDs, and I'm quite new to doing MS two set, but. I, I recently had a patient that did the MS2 step. I referred to a fellow colleague who'd seen this patient before to put in an IUD um, and then wasn't able to get in time and then has gotten subsequently pregnant again because I didn't give her a depot at the time. And now I'm going through this process of doing an MS2 step, giving her a depot and then mm -hmm. ensuring she's got that appointment. Um, so I think it's really like you're kind of a bit damned if you do, damned if you don't, because if you don't mm. do it at that time, you can have the, the other side of another unwanted yeah. pregnancy. Is mm. that you, Samantha? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, it, it's weighing up the risks of a, what I call an unsupervised ovulation versus, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a complication. And the, the risks of there being a complication at that time are very small. I just wanted to make um, a comment about the beta HCG. So the beta HCG was actually done about 13 days prior to the um, to the methipristone being given, and it was 15 uh, 50,000, right? Mm -hmm. So what would have happened to the beta HCG by the time of the um, abortion? Would have gone up by a factor of. Probably 50% or more. 
Oh, much more. Two to the power of eight, I've um, oh, okay. I've estimated. Yeah. Oh, so okay. I, 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 it goes up exponentially. Yeah. So where do you say you want the 80% decrease from? So if it had gone up way up and then come down again, her, her response is actually marvellous. It's a really good response, the being 2,000. Mm -hmm. But I'm just encouraging you all to think about that. Like, where do you, uh, you know, think about that it would have gone up, and so it's actually an even more significant one. Um, and I just ask a okay. quick question of Patty and, and Kath. Is it something? So, if you did a vaginal examination with a view to doing an IUD procedure, and you saw that there was quite a bit of bleeding, is that something that would make you think, oh, we should wait, or? Well, it depends, you know, quite a bit of bleeding. You know, it's one of those, <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, um, what, what it, is it? And I think it would be more the history of it. So if she'd come at day 13 and said, I haven't had a dry day. Every time I go to put the clothes on the line, I have to change my pad. And I wake up in the morning, I have to change my pad. And some days it's brown and some days it's bright red. I'd be a bit, little bit more thinking, you know, is it resolving? And it would be the history of it. And if she said, oh, in the last three days, it's been fine. This woman said she, 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 she'd given a good history of probably passing products of conception. And I would say she has passed the vast majority of it. And then she hasn't bled and she started to bleed a little bit this day. Um, to me, that wouldn't be terribly significant. If I was examining someone to put the IUD in and there was a clot sitting in the cervix, you know, or she was bleeding and contracting I would be thinking maybe there is a bit more in there maybe we should wait yeah okay um, yeah so I think the the longer I do this work for the less I rely on the numbers and the more I rely on the history okay and the less I would rely on the investigations uh Kathy has got a hand up um, yeah, I was just wondering, Patty or anyone else, would you, like she, she had endometriosis, so you might expect a fair bit of pain after the IUD was inserted. It, it, anyway, would anyone make a case, like if she were happy, just to, to leave it and wait and see what happened? Um, we, we just had one that was a bit similar to this, and it was a few years back, and I just can't remember the ins and outs of it, but we did an ultrasound after she had her IUD put in, and there was some... And, and, you know, the quality of the ultrasound is so variable and it was sort of came back as retained products. But mm. she was actually settling by the time she had the ultrasound. So we decided to just watch it and repeat it in a couple of months and it went away. So Yeah. yeah. Look, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to play devil's advocate and say I was going to sing from the songbook of don't investigate this woman and then you're, you've got less worry. Yeah. Um, because... Uh, uh, Beta HCG was reassuring, but there are there are services that don't do the beta HCG. They go on the history, and their their safety data is just as good. You had a really good history, Nicola and Kathy. There was every reason to insert it. The rest of the team are all nodding. Everybody else would have inserted it. Um, she didn't have a fever. She didn't have. Um, <clears throat> she didn't have malodor she didn't have an obvious discharge i'm presuming that her swabs were negative to begin with yeah um and so then i was going to challenge your reasoning for doing this the scan it is extremely unlikely there's a perforation if you can see the strings like she would have had to have perforated in the little front corner to still have that length of string there so it's extremely unlikely were you able to pull the string down? Uh, you, you, could you speak? You're, um, you're mute, Kathy. Sorry, Patty. Um, so I could only just see them. They were sort yeah. of up in, in the canal a little. Yeah. So, you know, I think if you can see the strings, it's unlikely that it would be a perforation. <clears throat> but um, you can see that there's that iatrogenic cascade, isn't there? once you start to look for something. Um, and I have a lot of problems with the scan report. So to me, that's a totally inadequate scan report because it doesn't tell us where the IUD is. It says it's abutting the abnormality. 
it's describing it as an abnormality. So the, 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 the person who provided the scan and who reported it has made their diagnosis rather than you know describing what they saw. So there was some material in the fundus um, and there was possibly some vascularity. Beta-HCG had gone right down. There was a very little uh, bit of placentation there at all, if anything. And is, is the IUD in the cervix or not? If it's not, if it's sitting pretty much within the, the uterine body, I would leave it alone. But that scan doesn't tell you that. And then the next point is that how are you going to unpack that when the most critical moment where she's having the scan and someone's giving her instant feedback that she's been mismanaged? And that is extremely hard to manage, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. um, I think the fact, Kathy, Nicola, Ange, et al., that she is still considering a marina means that you held her really well through all of that time. I think she's... I think she is, she's due for another call and she yeah. might will go ahead, to be honest. Yeah. Um, she just wanted a rest. Like she yeah. just had enough for now. Um, yeah. But she was absolutely, I guess I want to come in and see Nikki and Kathy and it will, I, I, I'm assuming it will happen. Um, yeah. Equal to. Yeah. And so then that will be a bit of closure for her or whatever. But, you know, holding her and... Uh, managing it and acknowledging that it wasn't you know perhaps ideal what you oh what you said before kathy um uh that uh, her, that her history of endometriosis is significant i was going to bring that up as well that uh i would have actually wanted to know just a little bit more about her menstrual history and what her premenstrual migraines are like and what they saw on laparoscopy and how she manages her pain with her periods. You know, if she needs uh, rectal voltaren and occasionally endone, I'd be thinking we're gonna to have to manage this woman's pain a bit more actively. Um, yeah. Pain wasn't a big feature, but, no. what, but what pain was a problem was her migraine. Mm. And I wondered what do you, what do, what's everybody's experience or has anyone had experience of, I, and I have had this experience with patients who were not uh, were not having their IUD inserted after an MTOP and weren't doing it at the time of menses, but I put in a progestogen and they get a migraine. And some women, that is one of the stimuluses of their migraine. And it'll be typical day minus five of their period and onwards that they'll get their migraine. So I'm just postulating that, you know, she had that release of progestogen into her bloodstream and was having a prolonged migraine. And that's why she looks so pale and unwell. And it's really hard to cope with anything else when you've got a migraine, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, yeah. so that might actually have been why it was really hard for her. Yeah. Have, I, have others had that experience of, uh, you know, women with menstrual migraine having an insertion migraine? Yeah, definitely. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's so interesting because you find so many migraines that are hormonally responsive, but then settle oh. prior in it because it's just as much the drop as the rise. Mm. And That's so right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Works so well for so many of my patients. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and so. We know that the the levels of progesterone after a marine insertion go up and then kind of drop. And so if you can coach women through that progestogenic sore breasts or whatever it is for the first couple of months, then it does settle. So, mm. yeah. I'm very interested to hear that um, Kathleen would consider leaving the device in mm. situ, which is, I think, useful said something along those lines as well patty yeah so had how do we know when not to do that i suppose is that i guess it's it's around the symptomatology and obviously this woman was very concerned and was was going to advocate for herself to have a curette i think what i did say to you um before when we had our initial consult about this is this is not uncommon after surgical abortion mm -hmm. to have a little bit of material left and the marina sitting just a little bit off or a little bit low 
And if we went back in and recurated them all, but we don't mm. do that. Mm. And we don't scan them because we are very rarely would we scan. We'd scan much fewer times after a uh, surgical than we would after an MTOP. And I'm just sort of trying to use that as a teaching point to maybe sit on our hands a bit more with the, um, the MTOPs. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, thank you. Learned lots already tonight. Yeah. And mm. then I also, if I was doing a curette for her, I, I would really encourage her to have the marina put back in then. Okay. Because uh, you've got good surgical control over the uterus and you can rub up the uterus before you put the IUD in so there'll be no clot, you know. Mm -hmm. So you could reassure her of that. <clears throat> I'd like to argue that this wasn't retained products. This was clot, <laughs> you know. And, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> and, and then I wanted to to ask you on reflection, mm. does this case change your practice, you know? It, it, in terms of like, because when we book in that woman for an IUD at that point, um, it's usually probably Robin and myself that are looking at that timing. So at the time I did say to Kathy, you know, do, and to Nikki, like, do we, wait? it was 2000 too much. Like, was that too high a beta and should we wait until it was in the hundreds rather than the thousands? But we, like, after, like, all this discussion, that's not what we're doing. We're just going with the 80% that drop. Yeah. And that timing and, again, that core discussion because she was very, um, you know, she she had described passing that pregnancy and it, it was pretty confident in that that's what had happened. <coughs> so it's that combination of those two things that where you book the timing and you like you have that booked in the first place so it, you can do the insertion mm. so we haven't changed our practice there's a, a great and I really that was going to be my take-home message <laughs> <laughs> you know really don't change your practice because of a, a, a poor outcome or it was a mm. poor outcome from the patient's perspective but in fact these are predictable things that can occur and it's the irritating pain and bleeding afterwards that is is the sting in the scorpion's tail with early medical abortion Erin's asking do you ever take a papel at the time of an ID, IUD insertion yeah I do when it's that kind of patient who's maybe got an increased BMI Erin and their periods are heavy and they're 38 plus and the scan's not bad, but it would be really good just to make sure that their um, endometrial lining's okay before we put the IUD in. But I, I wouldn't do it in this situation, but because a papel wouldn't get enough material. Is that what you were thinking to see if it was? Um, uh, just, just if in those gray, gray situations, they're post -em top, they say, you know, they're past products. They feel that the bleeding has stopped, um, but there's, you know, if you, not if you saw any bleeding, but they were thinking that their menstrual cycle was returning, would you possibly take a pipal then to see if it came back products of conception still? Or You could so easily miss products of conception because a pipal is such a tiny, mm -hmm. uh, you know, blind biopsy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what its sensitivity would be in that situation. Okay. Mm. I'd be more likely to put a point of care scanner on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the other thing that I'm uh, really keen to, you know, talk about. Maybe we could have a talk about that in another session. Is you know the use of point of care scanning, you know, peri procedure and putting in IUDs and checking on things. Because again, this Lena's experience. If um, if Ange had scanned her that day. Uh, and said, look, there's a little bit of something that's probably clot. I, we tend to just wait with these patients and it settles. That would have been a very different therapeutic scan yeah. than, than yeah. what would have happened elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, any, yeah. other, any other comments? Uh, just one thing, if you, know, you were able to do that point of care scan and there was a small, you know, um, possibly products or clot, but clinically well, would you just observe and delay the IUD or would you consider a, um, uh, an empirical course of augmented drofort and any other additional misoprostol? Before I put the IUD in? Mm. 
Um, the ability to do point of care scan post MTOP. Yeah, look, and I wouldn't advocate doing point of care scan after all MTOPs at the follow-up. I would tend to go by the history and, you know, kind of hone those historical taking skills rather than scanning them all because we know that um, when they did large scale studies of scanning people post-surgical abortion that most of them had retained, you know, met the criteria to retain products and most of them had no symptoms. So I'm just sort of advocating it to tailor it but not do it for everybody, yeah. If you had any doubts, Patty, that, um, and you thought, look, I'm, I'm not gonna go ahead with an IUG, what sort of interim contraception would you use? Would you um, use a hormonal contraception or what What would your choice be? The implant in my hand. <laughs> and I'd be saying, look, I could put this in today and then take it out and do a swap over. Um, okay. Yeah. Or you could use the pill, whatever suited them best, but just start. You know, offer, offer something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just aware of the time, and we always like at the end to, to go around and see if anybody in any of the regions wants to give us an update of what's happening in your neck of the woods, um, any uh, changes to staff or services or anything you want to update us on. Heather and Sophie, I had the delight of talking to Sophie last Friday about a couple of cases and that was that was great and within the course of the day she seemed to be churning through you know two or three patients and then one morning you know and that was great so it sounds like it's really taking off Heather. Yeah we are getting busier um, Patty I guess um, one concern for us is and I've talked to Kath about it the other day that we've just had this little rush in the last two months of um, Islander women from um, Vanuatu presenting um, without, you know, Medicare cover, yeah, minimal, yeah, yeah. Hist uh, minimal healthcare cover, and just experiencing such expense and the trauma of it, and not realizing <laughs> that they could get into this situation, and mm -hmm. also arriving in Australia and not having knowing how to access contraception. So, you know, one woman was due for a depot when she first arrived. Quite a concern really. And um, yeah, that's certainly keeping us busy. I've been spending a lot of time with these few women. Yeah. Uh, as has Sophie, yeah. And Sophie and I were talking about maybe not doing the blood tests, you know, what can we do to, ex to, to decrease the total cost, you know? And if you've yeah. got good clinical grounds and you, you're gonna be able to, because one of the patients Sophie was talking about was going to be leaving Bairnsdale and going somewhere else. And how are you going to manage her beta HCG follow up? But she was going to have a mobile phone and she did, uh, did have a good relationship with you guys. So maybe the mobile phone contact was going to be more important than going and doing a beta HCG mm. somewhere else. Right. Yeah, so yeah. To, try, to, to sort of try and tailor it so that they're, they're costing, uh, it's costing those women less. Yeah, um, I will share with you that at the women's, we are seeing a lot of later cases coming from the same group of people who I believe are being trafficked. Um, right. Yeah, and they have very little rights. And uh, uh, we're really concerned about the facilitation of abortions to make uh, socially inconvenient pregnancies go away. So it, there, there is, there's, there's, there's something that I think we need to address as a community here. Yes, yeah. I was planning tomorrow. I've had some contact with Union Aid Abroad, um, who you know it was set up initially by a nurse, but just seeing what they might be able to do from the um, Vanuatu side. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I was wondering, Carolyn, about um, Women's Health Victoria, you know, whether there's any advocacy role there as well. Yeah, well, let's take this offline and, um, you know, we'll get back to you on it because it's interesting you're having that experience. Carolyn's talked about it. We're having it at the women's. Um, anyone else from their centre? How are things up in Mildura, Erin? Yeah, so with the um, outreach clinic that I do in Robin Vale, it's very multicultural and probably about a third to half of my women at a time have no Medicare and are in a similar situation, but it's not just, you know, one set 
um, population. It's you know um, Tongan, Southeast Asian, um, transient workers. Fortunately, Vicky, the wonderful midwife and women's health nurse that I work with in Robinvale, she's made a, um, a an agreement or uh, with the local pathology service to get rebated, so reduce costs for pregnancy, so we can at least get you know. And a basic STI urine test, um, and for the full blood count, a, an initial beta and um, a repeat beta. And again, she spends a lot of time counselling um, these women for you know contraception plan to try to avoid this situation. Um, she's also been really proactive in getting um, free condoms in the local caravan services, and we have seen a decline in our um, request for terminations that way. Um, ah. Great. Well yeah. done. Yeah, great yeah. initiatives. And yeah. I'm just thinking it might be worthwhile just following up, um, just putting the different regions together to have a conversation yeah. about your strategies because they are such a vulnerable population, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, let's, we'll continue the conversation off mm -hmm. um, after this meeting. I can set up oh, something, yeah. set up a dialogue, mm -hmm. including you, Caroline, too, from 100. Yeah, because I, I know that you've doing lots of work with international students and yeah. Sir so should be pretty keen on that as well uh, because yeah. we are trying to um, do some work in this space as well and we are also setting up um, an STI vending machine in Mildura um, by the end of this year and people would be able to buy, um, not buy but get a free STI testing kit um, just by visiting the place. Oh, an STI testing Vending machine. Urine okay, yep. yeah, I had I had a completely different visualization. <laughs> <laughs> what is it an STI vending machine? Not the STIs, <laughs> but the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great, Sarah. So maybe we could have an extraordinary mm. meeting around this issue yeah. of the, the you know looking after the vulnerable. Yeah. Um, how about up in Achuka, Lara? How are things up with you? It's really great that you were able to come tonight. Yeah, definitely. Um, look, things are crazy. I, I call myself a you know quiet little provider just because at the moment the wait for GPs alone is you know going up a month plus. There's only four or five of GP obstetricians, and so the hospital's like nearly 50-50 staffed with um, locums at the moment. Poor Sarah's trying to you know run Bendigo and Achuca and do everything else at once. Bless her. Um, so I. I've very deliberately kind of kept it under the under the hood, you know. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it looks like things are getting worse rather than better just in general healthcare, but like supply. Um, but I'm doing what I can, liking everyone I can, preaching the good word of the marina. Um, <laughs> that seems to get around. So yeah, that's yeah, kind of where we're at. I think it's a, it's great strategically that Bendigo is uh, and Sarah are involved in the Achuka thing. I think that's going to be really, you know, in the mid to, mid, medium to long term, that's going to be really good. Yeah, and yeah. she's one of my besties, so. Yeah, oh, good. Oh, good. Sarah. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Anyone else? Because I'm just realising we're just a minute or two off finishing. Anyone else? Uh, in there? I just, I just oh, hi, Lou. Hi, everybody. I'd um, just like to say that we've actually got another GP He's come to our hub working two half days a week, a very senior female GP who provides MTOP. So we're um, really pleased we've got some extra services. Um, but just today, just out of the blue, I had a, um, a, a phone call from a GP registrar at a, another large primary care service who is wanting to know about how they refer people to us for MTOPs. And I said, well, you sound really interested. Are you interested in doing it? And she said, oh, yes, myself and another GP registrar are quite interested, but we just don't really know how to go about it. Oh, great. So, great. Um, yeah. so I did send a whole heap of information, but perhaps when we catch up at the end of July. Um, yeah, maybe they can come to a session. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fantastic, Lou, so, great work. So it's just finding these people and just, you know, starting that conversation in regards to that. But I just wanted to make one comment in regards to the case study, and, and we've had it time and time again in regards to the workup for um, a medical abortion and you know, where people's heads are at um, psychologically and emotionally, and then the big conversation around long-acting reversible contraceptions, particular IUDs. And we do exactly the same as what Kath has done down at the Peninsula Health. But I must admit, we do find women who are just so resistant 
to making a decision there and then on that day. Um, and even if you just say, well, we'll give you the script and book you a follow up. Um, and so sometimes it's just a really hard sell. So, mm. you know, I, I think you've done an amazing job, but that woman mm. is really keen. But we do find people just want some time out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it is about how they feel about that um, engagement because whether or not they'll come back or not. Um, and if they've been referred by another GP, which we get all the time, then they tend to go back to their GP, mm. even though they've had a reasonable experience with our service. But there's still that thinking that they go back to their GP, but eventually, you know, they may or may not make this decision. So it's a really hard call um, yeah. trying to get everything done in that, um, in that you know, pre kind of scripting um, appointment. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But maybe if we sort of uh, think of it in terms of it's an ongoing conversation and you have a part of it and their GP has a part of it, rather than thinking that you have to do some kind of LARC conversion therapy, you know, and that, you know, it, your worth is judged by how many LARCs you get in, because I would be certainly very guilty of that, you know, that I thought, you know, it was a failure if I didn't. But it's all about empowering the patient. And I still remember the patient who came back who told me that some chick at another hospital had forced her into having a marina and she wanted it out and I said oh what hospital was that and I realized that I was the other chick that had forced <laughs> her to have it in so <laughs> you know um and there I was taking it out because she really didn't want it. Mm. <laughs> um so it's, it's, it's all it's all about empowering and you know it's, it's the same with the the follow-ups you know how much do you harangue people on the phone at, at what point is this their decision to not come back some people have surprised me with the larks where mm. I just no like you, you know you, we give the same education and I you know I've been in contact with them two or three times and I think there's no way and then see their name pop up on the IUD list and I think oh like so it does you know that health promotion does work and sometimes it just takes them a, an extra month or so to yeah, that make nice. that decision and yeah. um and you've got to leave the space for them to make their own decision yeah have, have a safe safe environment for them to come back to that yeah hmm. yeah sorry can i just say i'm i'm with angie at peninsula health we've also um started our saturday clinic so a lot of clients who couldn't come to us during the week who have had an MTOP have come back for an IUD on a Saturday, which is oh, really great. A Saturday uh, clinic, fantastic. Yeah. Mm. How long have it's you been doing that, that for, Robin? Um, we're, I do it with Kathy, so we do one Saturday clinic a month, and we've been doing that. Oh, great. I think since last year, since the end of last year, and it's been really good because and it's always full. There's no one cancels. Everyone comes on a Saturday, and it it's it works quite well. So we've had a few MTOPs that have then come, come back on. for the Saturday clinic. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Mm. All right. Oh, okay. and Nicole, do you want to? Nicola? Nicola, sorry. Yeah. Just um, as an aside, I, I'm just wondering if anybody has any access to our education minister and some clout there. Uh, it's just time and time and time again with these young women who have zero or very little knowledge of their reproductive capacity. Now, it is the luck of the draw if you've got a proactive mum who takes you along for a contraceptive consult or if you've got, you know, no, no, no idea at all. And I just really think, you know, this is so much after the horse has bolted and what we really should be trying to do is to advocate for some innovative ways to get women educated and it's too late for the ones that have left school but you know we should be yeah. really trying to get a cross curricular um reproductive okay yeah. so yeah, yeah getting, absolutely getting yeah. the knowledge it's, it's, up there it's an all of society conversation that should be being had mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah Oh, uh, so a very important it. point. Yeah. Haven't got the solution to that, but it's a good way to end so that we we take it into the into the social context. You know what we're doing. It's important work, but there's an awful lot more to the uh, the whole story, isn't there? Mm. 
Um, we've gone over time, so leave if you need to, but <coughs> Raylene is just wants to have two minutes of your time, if you've got it, to talk about her study about early medical abortion. Oh. I didn't realise oh. that you wanted to speak. She's one of the Hi. students that uh, oh, she, she working is. with um, um, our director, Jane Tomney. Hi, Raylene, I'll hand it over to you. Sorry, we were not aware of that or we would have um, given you time earlier, sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. I, I love listening to this. It was so interesting. Um, sorry if it's a bit loud, but I just wanted to talk really briefly about my project because I am still looking for participants to interview. So my project is about health practitioners' view on the need for emotional support for women following EMA. And it'll, the interview will take around 30 minutes. So if anyone is interested, um, it'll be great if you guys can like shoot me an email. And, and if you guys are interested, I can, um, they, I can um, ask Sarav to send out an advertisement for my study. So yeah, I just wanted to um, tell right. you guys about yeah. that. So yeah, maybe Sarah, we could send it to all the participants and all the registrants because there's always people who can't make it on the night. All the best with that, Raylan. We'll be really interested maybe when you get your results, you can present it for us. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Thank you. Good night to you all. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy and Patty. Bye. 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 Bye